This conference will now be recorded. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to the August monthly partnership meeting of the Southeast and Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership, or SCDRP for short. My name is Heather McCarthy. I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the executive director of SCDRP. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. <clears throat> I have a bunch of SCDRP updates for you today. First, the SCDRP 9th Annual Meeting 2025 is starting to come together. Next, I'm thrilled to introduce cohort number one of the brand new SCDRP Mentorship Program. Next, I wanna get you thinking about whether you would like to run for one of the open seats on the SCDRP Advisory Board. Today, we continue our Partner Pick Summer Speaker Series with a double feature from NOAA. And lastly, we will wrap up with partner sharing time. So please be ready to share relevant news and announcements from around the region. So here we come, Wilmington, North Carolina. The SEDRP 9th Annual Meeting 2025 is an extraordinary opportunity to bring together multi-sectoral resilience and emergency management professionals from across the Southeast and Caribbean, including North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, and throughout the Caribbean. During this in-person meeting, the partnership will share updates from each state and territory, present cutting edge work on risk reduction and climate adaptation, and explore strategies for regional resilience. Online registration will open in September, and we will cap the meeting at 125. In the last two years, we have sold out. We have booked the ballroom at the Aloft Wilmington at Coastline Center. You can plan to arrive on Monday, February 3rd for field trips and meetups. You might also stay through Thursday for the invite-only Duke Roundtable. And you might also stay for the North Carolina Jazz Festival that following weekend. So Tuesday and Wednesday will be filled with presentations, panel discussions, super collider, socials, and additional events planned by the steering committee. The SEDRP room block is $133 a night, not bad, and includes the three nights before and the three nights after the meeting. The reservation link will be in the next newsletter. The SEDRP annual meeting steering committee, it just might be the most fun committee you've ever been on. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We have a good time together. This steering committee is short. It's a short term ad hoc committee and the time commitments are discreet. One virtual meeting every two weeks from September through February until February. And the annual meeting steering committee is a pathway to bring attention to relevant issues and projects that are important to your organization. It's also just a great way to interact and get to know other SEDRP members and have some fun too. The steering committee will be a multi-sectoral group of resilience professionals representing private companies, academia, and all levels of government and nonprofits from throughout the Southeast and Caribbean. So typically we have 24 to 25 committee members. They develop the content of the meeting. They invite the speakers and panelists. They organize the field trips and continuing education opportunities. And they invite sponsors and donations to enable us to offer student and nonprofit scholarships and invitational travel to community members and keynote speakers that inspire and challenge us. So we would love to have you join the SCDRP 9th Annual Meeting 2025 Steering Committee. I need 18 volunteers. And um, as you can see, um, the local team, Wilmington, is already stepping up. So I'm looking for at least nine more folks. So please email us at scdrp at socora.org if you would like to join. And we would be honored to showcase your organization at our meeting. These sponsorship funds are used to support conference-related expenses, provide need-based registration scholarships, and fund special events such as field trips, community interactions, and networking opportunities. So please direct all questions to me, heather at sakura.org, and payments are, can be accepted through our online portal, which you see on the screen, and will also be in our next newsletter. 
So we have been thrilled, absolutely thrilled with your response to the new SCDRP mentorship program. We received many expressions of interest and connected with many new students and professionals that we had never met before through social media, especially through LinkedIn. So please meet the inaugural cohort number one of the new SCDRP mentorship program. I think these are some of the most amazing people I know and some of the most amazing people that I am going to get to know. So we are thrilled to have these two 22 commitments for this fall 2024 session. And a big thank you to all of you that have come forward to participate. And if you miss this round, don't worry, cohort number two will meet up during the spring 2025 academic semester. So many of the names you just saw, they're graduate students and the professionals that are brand new to SCDRP. And I would like to be able to offer them a free annual membership in SCDRP for participating in cohort number one. And that's where I need your donations and sponsorships. So we're offering three sponsorship packages. The Rock of the Region package is $4,000, exclusive full sponsorship of cohort number one. The benefits are widespread recognition on all materials and posts related to the mentorship program. Four, free registrations to the SCDRP annual meeting in Wilmington and tickets to the mentor-mentee meetup that will also occur there. And heads up, I plan to have a mentor-mentee meetup, kind of reunion style, every year from here on out. There will be only one Rock of the Region. The You're Up Next package for $50 supports one graduate student. They are the next generation of resilience professionals. The In It to Win It package for $300 supports one early career professional, and it really expresses your commitment to building regional resilience capacity and skills. There can be many You're Up Next and In It to Win It sponsors. As sponsors, you'll have opportunities to engage in the participants, kind of hear future success stories, and we will also um, throw in tickets to the meetup in Wilmington. So if you or your company would like to donate in other ways, including in-kind contributions to the mentorship program, please email us at scdrp at sakura.org. The SCDRP Advisory Board election is coming up. So begin to think about if you would like to serve our region in this capacity or who you think would make an excellent addition to the SCDRP Advisory Board. Between September 5th and the 26th, we will be accepting nominations. The nomination form will be coming in the next newsletter. You must be a dues-paying SCDRP member to participate. Email us at scdrp at sakura.org if you're interested. We would love to hear from you. So today we continue the SEDRP Partner Pick Summer Speaker Series, and I think we all have been benefiting tremendously from your Dynamite Speaker suggestions. This special series has stretching through the months from June until September. In September, on September 26th, we will co-host with CERN, the Coastal Empire Resilience Network out of Savannah, Georgia, and bring you a double feature from Georgia Southern University. We will be hearing updates from Dr. Astley Aslan from the Institute for Water and Health and Luke Roberson, who is here today. Hi, Luke. <laughs> there you go, he's waving. The Community Engagement and Outreach Coordinator, both at Georgia Southern University. In October, a special webinar called the Fall Partner Project Parade is coming. SCDRP members love case studies, and let's highlight some from around our region. We will feature four outstanding projects in the Southeast and Caribbean that demonstrate exemplary potential for application to other locations. Let's learn from each other. So email scdrp at sakura.org to suggest a project for the parade. And now today's super speakers. Sharon Messick, hi Sharon, is joining us from Hancock County, Mississippi. And Dr. Chris Furman, hi Chris, is joining us from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. 
Sharon Messick is the director of the NOAA Southern Regional Climate Services. Sharon has more than 20 years experience in environmental data science and is known for her advocacy for open science. She has held her current position as Southern Regional Director for more than three years. In this role, she engages with constituents to understand their data and information needs and collaborates with partners to develop services to meet those needs. These place-based environmental science services are intended to increase constituent resilience and adaptation capacity in our changing climate. In addition, Sharon contributed to the NOAA Equitable Climate Service Delivery Action Plan, and she is very active in its implementation. Prior to working at NOAA, Sharon worked in private industry, supporting environmental data analysis and access for federal, state, and local government agencies. Sharon has a master's degree in geography and area development from the University of Southern Mississippi. Chris. Chris is wearing two hats these days. So first hat, Chris is the Deputy Director and Regional Climatologist of NOAA's Southeast Regional Climate Center, or CERC. In these roles, he directs the Center's Applied Research Program, which is broadly focused on the societal and human health impacts of extreme weather events and leads various monitoring efforts for the region, which involves summarizing and providing historical context for recent weather conditions and their impacts. Chris also oversees the development of tools and products that help deliver climate services to the region. Second hat. <laughs> Second, Chris is an associate research professor in the Department of Geography and Environment at UNC Chapel Hill, where he conducts research in applied climatology, hydroclimatology, and biometeorology. Chris was a contributing author of the 2014 U.S. National Climate Assessment and has served on review panels for NSF and NOAA. Prior to joining CERC, he was an associate professor in geosciences department at Mississippi State, also Mississippi, um, and served as the assistant state climatologist. Chris has nearly 15 years of experience in various aspects of applied and service climatology. Chris earned a Master of Science in Geography from the University of Georgia and a PhD in Geography from UNC Chapel Hill. Sharon and Chris, a very warm welcome to you both and a big thanks for taking time to share your knowledge and experiences with our partnership today. First, it is my pleasure to present Sharon Messick. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen with y'all. Okay, can y'all see my screen and hear me okay? All right, That's sounds good. great. So uh, thanks so much for uh, ho hosting us here today. We're really happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about uh, what we do in terms of providing climate services for the region. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page here because we come from so many different organizations at different levels and NOAA can be confusing uh, for people to understand. And so I like to start out by setting a context. So NOAA is part of the Department of Commerce and we have um, always through the years uh, been real conscious of discussing the return on investment uh, for taxpayer data collections um, and recently in this administration, we've had a wonderful opportunity to talk about why that matters, which is the socio part of the socioeconomic equation. And so, um, so to me, that is going full circle. Uh, many of you work with different parts of NOAA's mission. Um, everyone seems familiar with the weather service, with our operations, which supports hurricane hunters in the region, for example. Um, the research that we do, and um, of course, our coastal zone management, which is part of the ocean service, and then our fisheries, which is a regulatory function. Uh, we are part of NOAA satellite and information services, and so NOAA flies uh, 10 satellites and manages data from 17 satellites in partnership with NASA. Uh, and the Air Force, and that gives us the big, big picture view of what we do. And um, 
there's a breakout here of all of the components of satellite data and information services, but I think important for today is that under the National Centers for Environmental Information, we offer regional climate services. So myself as the director and Chris as one of, uh, you know, we have six regional uh, climate centers um, are part of the same regional climate services program uh, that makes an effort to provide data and information services to all of y'all to support your climate decisions. Um, and as I was saying, so we fly a lot of satellites. There's a lot of monitoring stations on the earth. We do a lot of deep sea. We like to say from sun to mud. Um, this adds up to about 70 petabytes of data that we preserve for the long term, talking about like 50 to 75 or 100 years out. And so um, it's a lot of data for people to work with, and it's really hard for anyone to find what they're looking for, even when they know what they're looking for and what their objectives are. And so a big function of ours is to provide this information in usable bytes. And um, that's what Regional Climate Services does. We're essentially a three-part program. Um, there are six directors, six regional climate centers, and then at the state level, we work with our state climatologists. And so this graphic sort of describes that we're a national program with a regional focus and we work at the local level. And so there's a lot of information, ideally going back and forth about um, what's needed to support your local decisions, which is where we're effective. Um, I wanted, and a lot of what we'll talk about today, we were careful to select products and services to feature that also include information for our Caribbean neighbors. Um, so often the observations and monitoring systems are not what they need to be, and we may have some data gaps. And so not all of our programs are really effective um, in the Caribbean islands. So today we're featuring things that we know are effective, and y'all can go take a look and give us some feedback on those and what else you might like to see. So that sort of is a big picture. Um, talking about our partnership with the American Association of State Climatologists here, we sponsored a meeting in 2022 um, in Puerto Rico to hear about some of these needs at a high level. And so, uh, you know, the high level takeaways were concerns about drought, flooding water resources, all of the coastal management needs, and then more recently, there was this meeting on extreme heat, which is a concern for, for many of us. And so I'm going to kind of focus uh, the products that I talk about on these primary concerns. Um, I'll start out with the drought monitor for Puerto Rico, which includes historic conditions, stream flow, and vegetation health index. There's a link here. Um, to that site and um, the information is updated periodically. Your state climatologist from Puerto Rico, Hector Jimenez, and the state climatologist from the Southeast states um, work jointly with Southeast Regional Climate Center with our NIDIS partners to integrate this information and put it out periodically. So this is a really good resource for uh, looking at conditions um, I would say quarterly, and, and Chris will talk about how we release some of that information quarterly um, as part of his conversation. But here's where you can look at this information for yourselves. Um, the next thing I want to talk about here is the Coast Watch data portal. So this is an example of putting satellite data to work for the region. So that's the goal of Nessus's Coast Watch program, which we operate jointly with um, AOML out of Miami. And what we're, we're looking at here, this example is sargassum because it's such a big concern um, pretty much annually for the islands. And, um, you know, satellite data products can be difficult to find your way through. And so here's, you know, a map, a link to a map viewer and then the sargassum inundation re uh, risk report. Um, also gives you a summary of the risk assessment of sargassum for these states. And um, of course, we know that sargassum is moving, well, that is essential fish habitat when it's out in the open and it's a hazard when it reaches the land. And it also is a concern in the Gulf states. Uh, we've heard from some of our oil and gas development uh, platform partners that they have real concerns about the intakes for their systems and so forth. So uh, here we work in partnership, again, uh, NESDIS, AOML, and also our NOS partners looking at the sargasm issue and 
putting the data to work for you in a way that's meaningful. Um, so you may not know that we also compile data over the long term for natural hazards. And this uh, record, this hazards viewer is an example of how you can access the information in this database that actually goes back hundreds of years. So it's tsunamis, earthquakes, and volcano data, includes photographs and other documentation about the events. Um, and of course, understanding what's happened in the past uh, can help you mitigate, um, make plans and mitigate for future response. And so this is a, a really, really valuable resource. I neglected, and I apologize to put the link on this page, but there is a slide at the back with all of the links and Claire is kindly sharing links as we go here. Again, you know, in the short time we have, I can't demo all of this stuff for you. The idea is to put out some products that may be of specific interest and then have you take a look at those independently. And um, we're happy to connect you with the subject matter experts or provide, you know, answer any questions for you um, as they come up. Um, another uh, historical database that we build is these tropical cyclone tracks. And so, um, you know, we're the government, we're the authoritative source of this data. So we all know what a hurricane looks like. We know about the, the threat cone. We know about the new products that are showing us where a storm may go. They're getting really good in their targeted modeling. After the fact, we confirm the actual track, the strength of the storm at different phases as it moves further inland or offshore in another direction. And this is the authoritative source of all of these tracks. So here again, we have a link to the interactive site where you can see here I picked Puerto Rico and it shows me hundreds of years of storms um, that have gone across the Caribbean. And in the interactive map tool, if you select one of these, you see that track called out and the statistics about that storm. And the data is available behind it. There are a couple of other ways to look at this in graph and chart form and the original data collected by the weather service is available. So all of this is preserved in perpetuity. So why do this? With so much of what we do, when an event occurs, people and agencies are responding to that event. Putting that event in context of time enables us to see trends and anomalies. And that's really important for understanding our Earth system and understanding uh, environmental change on our planet. And so that's the reason for doing something like this. And it's, it can be really interesting to go in and take a look at the history of storms uh, graphically um, as well. Um, Another one that we do, and again, this is a compilation of bathymetric data and making it really useful for you, is these coastal relief models. So if you're interested in looking at sea level rise or coastal inundation, you're gonna wanna know <laughs> what does it look like where the coast becomes underwater, right? This is really impactful when you're starting to look at winds and waves and currents and all of this other information. And we have the responsibility at NCEI to keep this up to date. And so these are continually updated digital elevation models. Um, and there's a link to the page where you can find more information about this. Um, this is part of the effort too, you may have heard of the Seabed 2030, where our goal is to map the seafloor um, for the world's ocean. And so making that data usable as we approach land in the coastal zone that's the function of this uh, product here. And the last thing I'm gonna touch on before I turn it over to Chris is something that's coming soon that I know will be of interest to many of you, and that is the authoritative um, precipitation modeling uh, that we're calling Atlas 15. So some of you may use Atlas 14 in your planning. Um, and if so, you will know that Atlas 14 is a retrospective look. It's a compilation of historical data and trying to look forward, but it doesn't integrate climate modeling. So the new version, Atlas 15, um, will integrate climate scenarios and um, ideally be more reflective of what we can expect in the future. And so this is being done area by area. And the first area is uh, Montana, essentially the Pacific Northwest. Comma. However, don't lose hope. We will later in this year um, talk to y'all and others 
to get feedback about the user interface. There will be a new website, there will be a map interface, there will be ways of accessing the data and information. And we would like to help gather your response to what that might look like for when you can use Atlas 15. And here, this is just a high level overview of when different parts of the data revision will be available. And of course, those will come out to you for, for feedback as well. So you can look later in the year, um, hopefully in February at Wilmington, we'll be able to have like a tools cafe or something, and we'll be able to show you the product demo for the user interface and get your feedback there. Um, beginning in 26, we should have this completed for the continental U.S., and we should have a preview of the OCONUS for the Caribbean, and then with your feedback, that should be completed in 27. Um, so again, that's the last slide that I have, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to talk about uh, the Southeast Regional Climate Center and some of the products and services that they uh, provide um, with support from NCEI and, and somewhat independently. So, Chris, take it away. Okay, thanks. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much, Sharon. Uh, so, yes, my name is uh, Chris Furman. I'm the Deputy Director of the NOAA-funded Southeast Regional Climate Center, which, as was mentioned earlier, located at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, the CERC, as we call it, uh, is one of six regional climate centers and is part of NOAA's Regional Climate Center program, we serve as the hub for climate services in the Southeast. Uh, our region, as you can see there, includes the states of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, the Regional Climate Center program is part of NOAA's multi-tiered structure for climate services that Sharon described uh, earlier. And just recently, we celebrated 40 years, 4-0, 40 years of providing uh, stakeholder and data-driven climate service to users across the country. Uh, I've listed our, our uh, website there on the slide uh, where you can access all of our uh, tools, products, reports, and services, as well as our contact info if you have any questions or uh, if you have any specialized data requests for us. Okay, next slide, Sharon. Okay, uh, so how do the RCCs provide climate service? Well, very simply, our job is to take data and translate it into useful information. And we do this in a number of ways. We collect and manage large amounts of climate data, mainly through the Applied Climate Information System, or ACES, and we ensure that it's not just accessible, but also reliable. Uh, we monitor recent weather and climate conditions, which includes providing historical perspectives and documenting the impacts to various uh, economic sectors. We conduct applied research, uh, which informs the development of tools and products to help decision makers understand and manage their climate related risks. Uh, and we do what I'm doing here today, which is engage with users uh, across the region to better understand their needs for climate information and how we can build data sets and tools to meet those needs. So along with uh, the uh, RCSDs, uh, we help support and enhance climate resilience by providing regional to local climate information. Okay, next slide, please. So this morning, I'm going to highlight three of our products. The first will be our Climate Perspectives tool, which we call CLIMPER. For short, we like uh, acronyms. <laughs> uh, and then I'll talk about a, a forecast tool that we've developed as part of our Heat Health Research and Outreach Program. And finally, I'll showcase our quarterly Climate Impact and Outlook uh, reports, which we co-author with our uh, well, with Sharon and also with uh, our uh, uh, RCSD uh, in the Northeast, uh, Ellen uh, McRae. Uh, the links to all these will be on the slides, but will also uh, they'll also be in the chat uh, as well uh, and at the end of the presentation. So feel free to check them out and bookmark them for uh, for future use. Okay, next slide. Okay, so let's begin with Climate Perspectives or our Climper tool. Uh, this is a web-based tool that takes daily precipitation and temperature data for thousands of weather stations across the U.S. as well as Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands and assesses the ongoing and recent state of the climate across a wide variety of timescales from the prior day uh, all the way back to the prior two years. And what makes the tool especially useful is that it provides, as the name implies, a climate perspective on conditions over those scales, um, which really allows users to assess the extremeness of the conditions, how they depart from normal or average, as well as how they rank in the uh, historical record. So for instance, was it the warmest week or warmest month on record? Was it the driest season or driest year on record and so forth? Uh, another neat aspect of the tool is that for each uh, weather station and time period, it identifies the closest historical analog, which provides a geographical context for recent um, conditions. So, uh, you know, if we get a cold snap here in central uh, North Carolina in January, 
the observed temperatures over a two day or even week long period may be more like those typically experienced in the upper Midwest. Uh, or during summer, we may see a heat wave with temperatures that are more like what we see in Houston and Phoenix. So that's a really, really neat aspect of the tool there. And I'll show you some examples uh, here in a second. Okay, next slide. All right, so here we see the homepage for climate perspective showing observed maximum temperatures for one day across uh, nearly 2000 stations. So uh, as you can see, the map perspective here on the slide uh, really allows users to visualize those regional variations and weather patterns across the country on different time scales. So to begin, I'm going to demo the tool here a little bit. Um, so to begin, we can select our region of interest shown there in the upper right and then select our variable and time period of interest that's shown there in the lower right. Again, because we have folks here from the U.S. Caribbean, uh, I'm going to zoom in and take us down to the region there on the next slide. Okay, and uh, this is a Google Map uh, interface, so I can zoom in on a region, see what stations are available. And here we can see that we have several stations available in the Caribbean. Uh, the stations are denoted by boxes there containing the value connected with whatever selections you made earlier. And you can click on a box or station to get more details. Now here I've clicked on San Juan, and you'll notice that for some stations there are two boxes, one on top, one on the bottom, they're pairs. And the one on the top is the value associated with the station's threaded climate record. And that, in many cases, goes back over 100 years. So if we really want to see the long-term perspectives on recent conditions at that location, we can click that top box, uh, as we've done here for San Juan, uh, and we can see another box pop up here on the slide that gives us values, rankings, departures from normal, amount of data that's available. And at the bottom, there's a, a link. And if you click on that link, which will be on the next slide, Sharon, if you go to the next slide, you'll get a station perspective table that summarizes all the temperature and precipitation observations starting on the day of the observation that's there at the top of the table and then going all the way down to the past two days, the past week, past two weeks, month to date, season to date, year to date, all the way back to the past two years that's all the way down there at the bottom. The closest analog or geographical uh, equivalent is also provided there uh, in the far right column as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so zooming in here to, uh, to uh, interpret the table, here we're focusing just on conditions over the prior day. And this happens to be a day back in February of this year. Uh, and we can see that this was a day that was warmer than average for San Juan. And in particular, the minimum temperature was much warmer than average. In fact, it tied for the third warmest minimum temperature observed on that day in the threaded record, which for San Juan actually goes back over 125 years. And we can see below the most similar day of the year. That's another uh, uh, part of the tool. Uh, and that shows that a minimum temperature of 75 degrees on this day in late February is more like what San Juan would experience climatologically in early May. So it really gives a sense of just how unusual the conditions were given the location and given the time of year. And you'll also see on the far left hand side, there's a view history button. And if you click on that, and that'll be on the next slide, Sharon, if you click on that, it will expand the table and show you all those dates in the station's record. So again, San Juan threaded record goes back 125 years. So there's a lot of years to look at and we can sort the table according to whatever variable or statistic we wanna look at. So here I'm sorting the ranks from warmest to coolest for minimum temperature. That's the variable that we're looking at here. Uh, and this allows us to get a historical perspective on when in the record we've seen the warmest minimum temperatures on this particular day. And here we can see, if we look at the years there, we can see that many of these really warm minimum temperatures have occurred uh, over the past couple of uh, decades. Okay, next slide. Okay, and if we go back and scan through the rest of the station uh, perspectives table, we can see that, you know, minimum temperatures weren't just unusual on that particular day in February. They were actually well above average in the month prior. Uh, and as we can see all the way there at the bottom, um, you know, and these temperatures are really, um, you know, what we would expect for San Juan uh, instead of February. These are really what we would expect in late March to, uh, to early April. So it gives a sort of temporal perspective as well, seasonal perspective on how unusual those conditions were. Okay, next slide. So uh, you may recall the temperatures last summer, it's been hot down there this summer too, but you might recall as well, last summer temperatures were very warm across the Caribbean. And so we can use climate perspectives to assess how unusual those conditions were. Uh, some of the warmest temperatures were observed in August and September, so kind of later in the summer. And so here we're showing the perspective starting on September the 14th and then looking back over the prior month, 
um, we can see the temperatures over this period were indeed record breaking uh, over several different time scales. But what's interesting is looking at the most similar city there on the right or the closest geographical uh, uh, equivalent. And we can see that for the two day period in San Juan, September 13th through the 14th, the most similar city based on observed temperatures was Phoenix. Phoenix, Arizona. This is really remarkable because uh, we know Phoenix is a very hot city, but of course in the Caribbean, we have something that Phoenix doesn't have and that's the humidity. Um, so, so during this two day period, what this tells us is that, you know, we had the Phoenix heat uh, in addition to the tropical moisture. And that really adds again, another sort of perspective to the extremeness of conditions there uh, over at least that, that two day period. All right, next slide. Okay, and so last thing I'm going to show here a more recent example for the mainland US. Um, as we know, it's been this past summer has been a bit of a, 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 I guess, a roller coaster ride in terms of rainfall. And, and we can use the regional map perspective tool here in Klimper to show which areas were wet and which areas were dry, and also how they rank historically. So here we're plotting the ranks of total rainfall for the month of June, this past June, that's there on the left, and July is on the right. Uh, and you can see with the exception of South Florida, which was very wet, most of the Southeast was very, very dry in June. My yard just completely dried up uh, in June. Uh, and in fact, it was record breaking in some cases. And then in July, the pattern flipped and many locations recorded one of their wettest Julys uh, on record. So just a month later. Uh, and so these types of queries can be performed on the fly uh, just by changing the uh, a criteria uh, there on the right hand side and clicking show uh, perspectives that that tab there on the right. You can you can change your selection and get it uh, and get a totally different uh, a perspective based on uh, based on the conditions that uh, uh, that you want to look at. All right, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and talk about another one of our web-based tools. Uh, this, uh, at least one that was developed as part of our heat health research and outreach program here at the CERC, um, a program that started all the way back in 2009 and focuses really on examining the meteorological, climatological, and the human health impacts related to extreme heat in the region. Most recently, we've been focusing really on drilling down to the local level to understand the nature of heat um, on time scales of, at least through field work, time scales of seconds to minutes and spatial scales. We're really trying to drill down to just a few kilometers or maybe, or, or maybe even just tens of meters. Um, and, and, and again, we're doing this largely through field work. And uh, you can see some of the photos there uh, on the right showing showing that. We're also utilizing uh, a machine learning uh, uh, techniques. Um, and so we you know, conduct applied, uh, you know, applied research and build tools uh, to try and provide uh, decision makers with um, you know, information on, on local conditions and, and help them also develop and uh, implement heat mitigation strategies. Um, and, and this has been done largely through workshops and uh, uh, engagements, mainly with folks from high school uh, athletics. Um, there's a picture there of uh, one of those workshops uh, there uh, at the bottom. And so um, I'll briefly demonstrate one of the tools that we've uh, developed and are currently um, in the process of making some uh, revisions to, to uh, predict a, a specific type of heat metric so next slide, please. Uh, and that is the uh, the wet bulb globe temperature. And I've underlined globe because a lot of people will just say wet bulb temperature. And in fact, this is not, wet bulb temperature is one component of what is the wet bulb globe temperature. So there's multiple components here. We don't want to confuse them. We've been hearing a lot more about this term recently. I'm sure everyone's been hearing this term used a lot more recently. I think it's becoming part of the public's meteorological vernacular, if you will. Um, most of us are obviously familiar with the heat index, right? And that's what the National Weather Service uses to issue uh, heat alerts. Of course, that takes into account the effects of humidity, which we know inhibits our body's ability to cool down. But the wet bulb globe temperature takes into account two other factors that are also very important in terms of heat stress, and that is radiation, both from the sun as well as the infrared radiation from our surroundings and from the surface, as well as wind speed, which can help cool us down by increasing the evaporation of sweat from our skin and also removing sensible heat from our skin as well. So to determine the wet bulb globe temperature, or just WBGT for short, we take these terms and we use them to calculate basically three different variables, which we add together to get the WBGT um, value. And these variables there on the right are the natural wet bulb temperature. This tells us basically how much we can cool the air via evaporation. We also use the black globe temperature that accounts for both the solar and IR uh, radiation and uh, air uh, temperature. Uh, and so you can see that the wet bulb temperature is weighted the highest of the three. These are weighted values, so you can see the weights there. That's weighted the highest, and that really reflects the importance of that evaporative cooling, 
which can be aided by faster winds in trying to reduce heat, uh, heat stress. Okay, next slide. Now, one important difference between WBGT and the heat index is that unlike the heat index, which was developed to be scaled with temperature, so we think of that as like a feels like temperature, you know, it's 100 degrees out, but it feels like 120, right? Um, WBGT is not scaled with air temperature, which means that when you look at values of WBGT, they typically won't appear as oppressive as the conditions that they're actually uh, representing. So a WBGT value of 90, you might look at that and say, well, 90 degrees doesn't sound that oppressive. But in terms of WBGT, it is. It's probably equivalent to a heat index that would be above maybe 110 or 115 degrees. So WBGT is, instead of communicating the values, we typically communicate conditions through flag levels, colored flag levels, which you can see here. These flag levels, so they correspond to specific WBGT values above which, in this case, athletes and other groups should adopt specific activity guidelines to to safeguard themselves uh, from, from heat. The example I'm showing you here on the slide is from the North Carolina, North Carolina High School Athletics Association, and it shows that WBGT values below 80 degrees are generally safe, but above 90 degrees, you cancel all activities, practices, games, et cetera. And you'd make various activity modifications for WBGT values that are in between 80 and 90. Okay, next slide. Also mentioned that the National Weather Service has also adopted a regional set of flag level guidelines that account for geographic variations in extreme WBGT values. Lower thresholds, obviously, just like with the heat index, you're gonna find those across the northern tier of the country, higher thresholds across the southern tier. Um, but it's important to note though that there is considerable local variability in WBGT that's not captured at the regional level like what you're seeing uh, here on the slide. And this relates to local uh, variations and things that we all kind of know anecdotally, things like temperature, humidity, cloud cover, shade, and wind speed, those vary on very, very local scales that are not always going to be captured by these regional maps. Okay, next slide. And as I mentioned, we have a heat health program here uh, at the CERC, and so through field work, we've been able to reveal some of these variations. Um, just real quickly, uh, some of the work we've done at uh, high schools in North Carolina. Uh, the high school there on the left is actually a high school down on the coast. Um, and then the one on the right is a high school in central North Carolina in the Piedmont region, not far from where we are in Chapel Hill. And while you may think, you might assume the WBGT would be higher along the coast, what we found through our work is that the general lack of trees and the steady afternoon breezes that are common along the coast actually result in lower WBGT values because wind speed is, again, a very important component to that, and that actually helps make conditions a little less uh, oppressive. Contrast that with the high school in the Piedmont, which in this case is situated in a low-lying area, lots of trees, also there's wetlands nearby, and so what you actually end up with are WBGT values that are much higher there than they are on the coast because of the humidity, more stagnant air mass, and also the lack of wind as well. So local variations are very important, and we need to do a better job of capturing those and incorporating those into our uh, forecasts. Okay, next slide. Uh, all right, so real quickly, I'm just gonna provide a brief demonstration of our WBGT tool. In the interest of time, I won't go over all the technical uh, details of the tool. I'll just mention real, real quickly that the resolution that we're making predictions at for the, for the continental US are at two and a half kilometers. So that's consistent with the National Weather Service forecast grids. But because of map projections, okay, geography matters, because of map projection, we call them issues, but they're not really an issue here. We actually have um, forecast and data at 1.25 kilometers across the Caribbean, across Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. And I'll show you some examples of that here uh, in a second. Brief history of the tool here. We originally developed this just for the Carolinas back in 2018. We expanded the tool to cover the Eastern two thirds of the US a few years ago. We added a menu of flag level guideline options a few years ago that I'll show you here. Uh, in a second and probably the biggest news is just earlier this year in fact in february we added puerto rico and the u.s virgin islands and the uh, uh a demo that i'm going to show you here is actually for uh puerto rico and uh i guess in the interest of time i'll go ahead we'll go ahead to the next slide sharon so i can show a few of these um so first just real quick if you go uh to the main um the main web page there for the wbgt tool you'll see the domain uh, over the continental U.S. If you want to go to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, just click in the upper left there, and that will take you to that domain, which is on the next slide. That domain, yep, there we go. There's Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and you can see our domain is outlined there in white, and you can see that we have forecast grids not just for the main islands, but also the outlying islands as well. So we have data basically covering the entire U.S. Caribbean. Okay, next slide. 
All right, so to select the location where you want to generate a forecast, we've got several different options. Um, you can, uh, at the top of the Google map, there's a text bar where you can begin typing the name of your location and it will auto-populate. That's, that's a common way to do it. Um, if you go to the next slide, Sharon, uh, you can also type in the uh, a coordinates if you happen to know the geographic coordinates of your location. Uh, a lot of us are scientists, so we probably know that information. If you do, you can go ahead and click it, or you can go ahead and type it in there. Or if you go to the next slide, this is probably the most common method that we use in Google Maps. Just click on the Google Maps, select your location, and uh, it will display the coordinates in the text bar, and you can pull the variables uh, from that associated grid cell. And so here I've selected uh, because we were at the heat summit that Sharon mentioned in San Juan back in uh, 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 February, we chose the uh, uh, the medical sciences campus there at the University of Puerto Rico in San Juan. And so on the next slide, so I've selected my location. Now I need to select the flag level guidelines, which is done at the bottom there. I've blown up the uh, drop down menu there on the right to see our current menu of flag level guidelines. Most of these are developed by high school athletic associations, but there are some that are specific to other vulnerable populations like the military, pediatrics, marathon runners, and so forth. Um, and also the uh, the weather service regions that I showed uh, earlier, those are the KSI regions um, uh, that you see there. Those can also be selected to match up with those thresholds. Um, and so uh, one big question we have, at least for the Caribbean, is what are the most appropriate flag levels for the Caribbean? That's an open question. That's one of the things that we're working on right now is to try and figure out what flag level would be most appropriate to meet the needs of populations in uh, in the region. So after I select my flag level guidelines, I select which model run I want to use. Uh, usually folks will just select the most recent model run. We'll, we do give you options to select previous runs if you want to kind of see how models are trending uh, over time. And so once I've done that, I hit the submit button. And so Sharon, if you go to the next slide, uh, it just takes a second or two to run. And so what you get is a forecast chart um, that's generated um, uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, and that shows the uh, the model WBGT over the prior 24 hours. Um, that's part of the chart there that's shaded on the left-hand side. And then we have the forecasted WBGT up to five days. So we have a five-day forecast uh, of WBGT at that uh, location. If you mouse over the chart, a text box will pop up showing the forecasted WBGT for whatever hour you're mousing over, as well as the estimated WBGT value in full sun and shade. And so the range in values from full sun to full shade is illustrated by the gray area shaded there uh, on the chart. And this information is really useful for planning outdoor activities because it shows how flag levels may change if you're able to access shaded space. That's really important. Remember, right, uh, solar radiation is an important part of WBGT. And so if you can access shade, you can lower those flag levels. Um, below the forecast chart, you'll find the activity guidelines that you selected. Okay. Um, and in this case, the forecast for the next day at the Medical Sciences Campus in San Juan was for yellow flag conditions using these particular guidelines. But if you're able to access shade, notice the flag level drops to green flag. OK, um, so that's a really that's a really neat aspect of the tool. OK, next slide. And one thing I want to illustrate real quick is how the selection of flag level guidelines influences the WBGT forecast. So here I've selected a location kind of on the outskirts of San Juan. OK. Um, and it shows for this particular day that the forecasted conditions would be for green flag. If we use the KSI region or the region three from the National Weather Service, which includes the southeastern U.S., but I guess by extension, you would say that would be appropriate for the Caribbean. But that's kind of an open question. We don't know. But let's just use region three as an example. That would be the forecasted WBGT, green flag conditions. OK, but if you go to the next slide. Let's say we change those forecast guide or we change the uh, the flag level guidelines and use those established by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Now the flag levels change. The forecast is the same. The WBGT values are the same, but now the flag levels are different. And notice now that instead of forecasting green flag conditions, if we use the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, we're now forecasting black flag conditions, which means we cancel all outdoor activities. OK. So selecting the appropriate flag level is really, really important. And this is where we need more work. More research needs to be done to understand what those appropriate flag levels are for different populations. OK, next slide. 
And this one, okay. In the interest of time, I'm actually going to skip this one. This is just some of our ongoing work in this area. I'm happy to talk more with folks offline about it, but I do want to highlight our last product here, which is our quarterly climate and impacts reports. There we go. Um, so this is, again, as Sharon mentioned, a collaborative effort between the, uh, between the RCCs and the RCSDs. Um, these are produced quarterly and they cover climate conditions and impacts over the prior meteorological season. So we'll have the summer one coming out next month. Uh, we also um, highlight any notable weather events, and any severe weather, flooding, drought, tropical cyclones, temperature extremes, uh, and also impacts in uh, uh, agriculture and water resources. We also discuss what's going on with ENSO. We provide regional context for the seasonal outlooks produced by the CPC that focus on temperature, precip, drought, tropical cyclones, et cetera. This past fall, one thing I'll really highlight here is this past fall, we debuted an expanded section on conditions and outlooks in the US Caribbean. We now have a full page of the report dedicated to the US Caribbean, and that page is now translated into Spanish as well. Um, since this is a, a relatively new section of the report, we're seeking input and feedback from all of you and from all of our partners in the Caribbean. So if you can, please check out the reports. You can access them through our website, which is there on the slide. It's also going to be at the end of the presentation and in the chat. So you should be able to find it somewhere. And we would be really grateful if you could provide feedback through just a short Google form there. Um, and, uh, and of course, let us know if there's information you need that you're not currently getting through other products and reports. And of course, we'll try to uh, incorporate those into the uh, quarterlies. And so with that, I think I will, uh, I think that should be the last slide. Yep, there's the links. Um, and so we're happy to take any questions. I'll hand it back to Sharon or uh, Heather, but um, thank you all so much. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Sharon and Chris. So let's let's do one or two questions. We've got a little bit of time left. I'll look for your questions in the chat box and or raise your virtual hand or your real hand if I can see you. Questions. Keep in mind that all the links you've seen today will also be in our next newsletter and on the resources page of the SEDRP website. And I see a raised hand, Jeff Morris. Hey, well done, y'all. Thanks for that very interesting information sharing putting it together. Um, Sharon, I had a question on uh, um, on the um, boy, I forget it now. Oh, so when 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 is the um, <laughs> when is the information or the next version? I'm drawing the blank here. So 14 p.m. So Atlas 14. There you go. Mm -hmm. Atlas 14 is out right now. When is Atlas 15 coming out? You had mentioned it's coming out soon. Is there is there a range or a date? So the methodology, I believe, has been established, and there is a more detailed timeline project, uh, uh, projected. And I uh, mentioned, I think, Montana in the, that area in the northwest is the first state that will be available for review and getting feedback. And I believe that is the end of uh, calendar 24 beginning of fiscal 25 um, and then I think later in 25 is the rest of the continental U.S. and then Caribbean uh, will be previewed in 25 and available uh, the Okona should be available in um, 26 is, is what I believe so again this is it's an interesting combination where we in the regions are doing outreach on behalf of the weather service who's doing the development so there's you know a little bit of back and forth on this um, but we can keep you updated as the timeline is nailed down great thank you thanks Jeff all right, so you see on this slide uh, the email address of Sharon and Chris. So feel free to, to jot those down and we can um, drop them into the chat as well. So Sharon and Chris are here for you to, hear, uh, to answer your questions, uh, to talk about applications of this enormous amount of data, um, extremely valuable in, in, all sorts of, um, in all sorts of ways. So please reach out um, to Sharon and Chris and um, we certainly thank you both for taking the time to uh, share with us today. And I will I'll just have two more slides and I'll drop over here. And we are just about out of time today. So I think we're gonna have to do partner sharing online. So if you would please um, 
drop announcements into the chat box and Claire and I will be able to hang around for a few minutes afterwards to collect all of your announcements and we will make sure that we put them in our next newsletter and also post them <clears throat> on the resources page of the SEDRP website. So this concludes our August monthly partnership meeting. A very special thank you to our super speakers, Sharon Messick and Dr. Chris Furman. And thank you all for joining us today. I will see you again on September 26th. And in the meantime, email me. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.